for joining the conversation here. Um, feel free to realize that um, we've got all this stuff on that community site that you can check into later. But in the meantime, um, what we're going to do today is proceed with the IFTDIS, the Interagency Fuels um, Treatment Decision Support Modules. And uh, to Kim has some great news to share with us and some awesome training. So, Kim, take it away. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, good to see. Well, I guess I'm not seeing you all again, but um, I'm back again for another round of, uh, of talking about uh, IFTDIS and spatial modeling and uh, and I've invited um, Wes Hall from the RDNA and Jennifer Anderson from Yosemite National Park to help me with this. And uh, we've got quite a bit of stuff to cover today. So um, uh, what I want to do, and I kind of want to go through the first part fairly quickly because I really want to get to uh, Jen and Wes's stuff because it's, to me, it's really where the rubber hits the road here. So, um, but I want to just point out a couple of things. So let me see if I can get the screen sharing worked out. So I'm just for y'all, I, I know I'm sure we've you've we've been on calls and stuff together, but I'm Kim Ernstrom. I work for the Wildland Fire Management RDNA. Um, I'm actually in the detail right now with NWCG, but I'm um, doing some of my day job as well, back and forth with some of the IFTDIS and fuels uh, tech transfer stuff as well. But I've mostly been working on IFTDIS over the past, you know, five, six years. Um, but do, you know, all the other RDNA things as they come along through the summer. So um, I'm really excited to show you guys some of the things we've got today as it ties to the National Prescribed Fire Review and um, just things to think about going forward with a lot of this fuels planning stuff. So let me, I'm going to kill my camera and I'm going to hop over real quick. I just want to point out a couple of things. Um, if I can get the right darn window up here. Okay. This should be IFTDIS. I want to start with that one. You guys see in the IFTDIS website there? Yep, we're good. Okay, great. All right, so I got that right. That's a good start. So I just wanted to point out some things on the website here real quick. Um, we're going to talk a lot about IFTDIS. We're going to do some comparisons with BEHAVE and stuff. But um, there's a few little things that are kind of um, sort of breaking news. But um, we've increased. So these this is the IFTDIS homepage, and I recommend people stop here every once in a while to uh, see what's new. So we always try to have our announcements that are new things. You can see we uh, says create large landscapes. And what we were able to do is increase our landscape size in IFTDIS from three and a half million acres to now up to 12 million acres for different uh, types of analyses and and creating landscapes. So that's that's quite a jump from what we used to do. And I know a lot of folks were hoping to be able to do that, to look at say an entire an entire forest or an entire unit of some kind so that's a that's a big change and then uh, we've added the new um land fire layers in here so we've got the most current which is the land fire 2020 and we've also added i'm going to scroll back here just real quick um we've done some map enhancements things people were asking for uh, the ability to change the symbology on the map um, was a real kind of a, a, a buzz kill sometimes because you couldn't see what was behind your polygon. So we're now able to change a lot of the polygon uh, colors and, and fills and, and transparencies and things like that. So check that out on the map studio. That's some new stuff. Um, the other things I wanna point out is some of the user support that we have. And Josh Hyde, who works for University of Idaho and works with has worked with us for many years now and is um, the brains behind our um, help our help system. Um, he has some amazing resources on here. If you haven't looked through the help in IFTDIS, that's the place to go. Um, we did add a new thing in the support forums that I wanted to show you guys. And uh, we've always ha we've had these community forums up here for uh, questions and answers and ideas to exchange ideas and stuff. But we added a new one called the Prescribed Fire Planning Forum. Um, so you'll have to, you get a separate login for this site. We, we haven't been able to, um, to tie it into the login with IFTDIS due to security things. But so if you click on that, you'll just, you'll, you can set up your, um, um, uh, if you don't have that account, just use this click, this button here to click, you can set it up and then you can get into that burn plan forum. And the idea is there just to, to specifically talk about using IFTDIS for burn plans. So just wanted to point those couple of things out to everybody let you know that those are some new things and we'd love feedback as always. We, we really like to hear from you guys. The other thing I wanna point out is the Wildland Fire Learning Portal. And we have two, this is the homepage. So this is before you log in, but once you log in, um, 
you have access to all of these self-enroll courses on the right-hand side. And you can see there's two of them right here, right in the middle, IFTDIS Overview 2022, and that's a great IFTDIS um, intro. If you've never used IFTDIS before, or need a refresher on some things, that little, uh, it's about a two hour course, will walk you through a whole bunch of all the different parts of IFTDIS. And then you can see right next door, we've got the how to use IFTDIS for uh, prescribed fire plans. And um, that's a new course that we developed um, this spring. We're using parts of it in the RX 340-341 course. Um, but, and I'd love to get feedback on it. I, I kind of feel like it's still in very much a test mode. And I've got a little um, survey in there for people to answer some questions and give feedback on the course. It's by no means finalized. Uh, would love feedback on what y'all think about it. And if there's things we can change or add or, or do differently, that would be great. So um, anyway, I just want to point those resources out before we get rolling into our presentation. So with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and switch over to my PowerPoint. And hopefully I'll get this part right because, okay, actually, let me do this. Let me stop sharing that. Let's go to PowerPoint. Okay. Um, oops, I can share here. Sorry, this is doing it through the web is a little bit too tricky for me. Okay, let me go back to this screen. And let me hit present. Okay, you, wait, you guys are not seeing that still, I'm sure. Not yet. Okay, hold on, stand by, I'm getting there. I just gotta move some windows around here, I think. There we go. Okay, if I say share that. Okay, so now you're seeing PowerPoint, I hope. It's coming up. Bingo. Right, let, me, let me pull it up to presentation mode. Hopefully that'll work. There we go. Is that is that full size now? Yep, four by four. All right, all right. That's amazing. We did it. Okay. All right, here we go. So what we want to talk about today is using IFTDIS for prescribed fire planning. And like I said, I'm going to whip through the first handful of slides so we can get to Jen and and Wes's stuff. Um, we want to talk about kind of comparing some things. I know a lot of questions have come up about using BEHAVE and IFTDIS as it relates to prescribed fire burn plans. Um, so hopefully this will help dial that in just a little bit. And then uh, Jen's going to talk a little bit more about um, some stuff as far as using IFTDIS for some uh, the planning process leading up to doing a burn plan, like how you prioritize and how you decide where to burn and things like that. So we're gonna cover a lot of things that are sort of high level. And I think the idea behind that was to, to show everybody this high level view of a lot of things. And then if there's interest down the road and we can work with Jen on certain parts of this, maybe we could do another um, talk or something where we could dive a lot deeper into any of these pieces. So um, let's, let's keep that conversation open as well. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about modeling. <clears throat> we're gonna talk about some comparisons. Jen's gonna go through some examples from Yosemite and then Wes um, what participated on the lost dispenses prescribed fire review and uh, <clears throat> did a lot of work using some of the spatial modeling to <clears throat> identify those critical factors in that escape, but then also thinking forward on how to use that more for building better burn plans. So <clears throat> that'll be the focus there. So I pulled these from the National Prescribed Fire Program Review. I'm not gonna go through each one of these, but um, this is from the PowerPoint that was sent out. That's that quality assurance checklist that came out of Appendix B. And these are some of the pieces that we're gonna to touch on today. Um, not in great depth, but I think we'll at least kind of breeze through them so you get sort of the connection of what we're talking about with how it ties into this checklist. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about element four and how to use some of the tools in IFTDIS to look at the land fire data and, uh, and maybe beef up that section of your plan. Um, and uh, like I said, perhaps down the road, we could talk more about editing your data and stuff, but we're not gonna talk about that today. Um, but I will point a few things out. And then of course there's the prescription part. And uh, this talks about a lot about Behave Plus and using um, Behave for those prescription pieces, which is great. I mean, that is certainly a way to, to do business. Um, if you just has some very visual ways to do that as well. So I'm gonna show you some comparisons there. Um, and, then the, and then the organization equipment, contingency and holding, to me, I always think of those sort of as a, as a all together. 
Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. And then these other two pieces um, using Behave Plus, these are some of the common mistakes that were outlined in that PowerPoint. Um, and then also how to document some of your modeling and where, how you can do that um, as you write a burn plan. So anyway, I just wanted to tie some of this back to that National Prescribed Fire Review. And like I said, we're not gonna talk about any one of these in depth, but I think we'll touch on some things. So, so the first thing I wanna talk about is just remind everybody that these models we're talking about, and I don't care if it's BEHAVE or a nomogram or IFTDIS or with the stuff in WIFTIS or FLAM map, it's all based off of the same spread equation, right? This is all the surface spread stuff that we talk about. It's the same assumptions. Um, everything is still in play, regardless of which one of these you use. So I know sometimes people think, well, well, behaves easier than, you know, than um, IFTDIS or FLAM map is different than, you know, and it certainly the outputs are, but the underlying thing we're doing when it comes to modeling fire is all the same. So I just want to remind everybody that we're all starting <clears throat> on the same sheet of music. The differences come in is to how we display this stuff. And, uh, and it's really no more complicated than going back to nomogram days. And I know we don't really teach these really anymore, but to me, this was always the foundational piece of understanding fire behavior. When you use a nomogram and you put your inputs in, so for example, your, you know, your fuel moisture, and then you have to run around the nomogram and draw your box. The size of that box is really the size of your output, right? So as Behave Plus has been developed and then IFTDIS, really all we're doing, at least for the basic fire behavior outputs, when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about this image here on the top right um, for the IFTDIS piece. It's just a nomogram we're put into Behave. And so it behaves a computerized version of nomograms essentially for the surface spread stuff. And then in IFTDIS, the basic fire behavior output is just it's just behave on a map. So it's looking at those individual values, pixel by pixel by fuel model. It's really no more complicated than that. Um, so I just wanna remind everybody sort of where this all comes from. Um, this image down in the bottom right, now this is a spread model and this is a little bit different. This is the uh, minimum travel time model and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but essentially what we're doing here is, is taking this, our basics from a nomogram and displaying it essentially on a map um, or on the numbers that we get in the, in the table from Behave. So how are things different in IFTDIS versus Behave? Um, just to do some comparisons. Um, so you can look down through the inputs that we use for these. And again, I'm talking mostly about the basic uh, surface spread stuff, flame length, rate of spread, fire line intensity, that type of thing. Um, um, so you can see what we what we use in inputs for a nomogram, how Behave handles those things. You can do single or multiple fuel models in Behave. And then IFTDIS, of course, uses the, the fuel models in a spatial sense. We look at them pixel by pixel on a map. Uh, fuel moistures, we always have to enter fuel moistures. Doesn't matter which tool you're using. Uh, IFTDIS does allow you to use fuel moisture conditioning. And I'm not gonna explain necessarily what that is here, but you can look at that up in the IFTDIS help and that'll, that'll walk you through. Basically it's adjusting your fuel moistures based on terrain, aspect, um, elevation, et cetera. Uh, wind speed, you always need that for running any of these models. IFTDIS happens to use the gridded winds model, which allows it to correct for terrain influence. Um, and then for our crown fire, we've got some options for both behave and for, uh, for IFTDIS when you're selecting those. So that's the inputs. So the outputs, again, that's kind of where things look different. Um, the outputs here is an IFTDIS example of the basic fire behavior on the map. And then this is the, I used the exact same, I ran these the other night and these are the exact same numbers, essentially. I ran it in behave and you can see it's broken down by fuel model here on the left with the rate of spread and flame length. And then in IFTDIS, it's the same thing. It's just displaying it on the map in colors. So that's really, that's that's the difference. We can see it. Um, so the outputs here, uh, again, rate of spread, you get that in a nomogram, you get it in Behave and IFTDIS, fire line intensity, flame length. Um, you can get those as well. Crown fire, you can do that in Behave or IFTDIS. Uh, spotting distance, I say sort of because we don't have a direct output. You have to actually download it and look at it in ArcMap. Um, 
And then BEHAVE does allow you to do scorch height, mortality, and probability of ignition. And we don't have those modules in IFTDIS right now. So um, as you can see, there are some things that, that there are differences and depending on what you're trying to use it for, um, you're gonna pick and choose the right tool for the job. So that's, that's kind of what I wanna remind everybody is how these things compare. So the- can. Yeah. Oh, real quick. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, definitely we stop me. a question about, questions. Yeah. about FES and the outputs or the uh, the model that's at, and it's my understanding that FES is still using Rothamrel as well, yeah? You know, that I don't know a whole lot about FES. I would defer to somebody here that could yeah. ask. Yes, it does. It does use Rothamrel. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Wes. Yeah. Yep. So that's really the only spread equation we have right now. You know, like the guys in the fire lab are working on a lot of new stuff. Um, but right now we're still pretty much any fire spread model out there for the most part. There's stuff that's being used that's a little different, but for the, the mainstream ones that we all use, we're, we're still using that, that same model from 1972. So keep that in mind. So the way I think about IFTDIS and its use, these are the five elements, the primary elements I think of, you can use it for other things, but when I think of using IFTDIS in a burn plan, these are the five I think of. And I'm just gonna really quickly show you a couple examples. Like I said, I really wanna to get to Jen and, and Wes's info here. So, the, and this, this we go over a lot of this in the online class with the Burn Boss on the learning portal. So if you want some more in-depth information for each of these elements, I really recommend you go and take a look at that online course. Okay, so let me make, now my screen doesn't want us trade. Here we go. Hey, uh-oh. I think I got locked up here. Shoot. That's fine. Oh, while you're while you're troubleshooting that, I, I just want to put the plug in that 3D Pro, if you're using our fuels tools, 3D Pro is trying to use that dynamic physics model. So yeah, thanks. Yeah, there are, like I said, there is some new stuff coming out. And within several years here, we're gonna we're gonna have to learn a whole bunch of new stuff when it comes oh. to fire modeling and spread modeling and things. So it's neat. I mean, we've got a lot of dynamic um, things happening in the research world. So be curious to see how that all comes about. But right now, this is still what we're using. So, so for element four, just real quick, this is a quick snapshot of how you could use the, uh, the um, fuel model and looking at a map in IFTDIS and the 40 fuel models from um, Landfire. Um, this is a burn plan, actually one that was written when I worked down in South Florida. But um, you can see this was one way to do it. We just broke out all the names of the different types of fuels and we put the percentages. Well, a heck of a, in my opinion, a heck of a lot better way to do that is just show the map. Um, that to me is a lot better representation of what we've got and you can still show the percentages of things um, through the report system in IFTDIS uh, by downloading that. So one quick and dirty way to save yourself a lot of um, text and typing is perhaps think about using one of these maps instead to display your fuel models and your distribution. This is a behave version. I'm gonna talk now a little bit about prescription. Um, so this is element seven. Uh, these are the outputs from behave plus version six. And um, so I'm gonna show you as same example in IFTDIS, but this is the behave way to do business. Um, you put in your fuel models, you put in your inputs, same inputs we use in IFTDIS, fuel moistures, wind speed. Um, <clears throat> And then we get our output and that's you see that here in the table and we also get that in our um in the graphs that we get from behave so rate of spread flame length and surface spread distance and once you give it a time um the cool thing about using the same deal in IFTDIS is this is the input page here on the right uh same kind of thing it's asking for the exact same inputs um you, you, hit, you do your run. These are the choices of models that you can use in IFTDIS. And I'm focusing here on this one, the landscape fire behavior, the basic one, because um, that matches up with what we get in behave. And rather than getting the table of numbers, now we get the map. And now I can see my, this in this case it's flame length. Um, I can see my flame lengths on the map in different colors. And when you click on it, there's a tool in IFTDIS, the little identify tool. If you want the actual numbers for each pixel, you can just click on each pixel and that'll bring up the, uh, you know, the output here for with the actual numbers. You can also see your inputs as well. So that's really the same. I just wanted to show you, this is the behave way. This is the IFTDIS way. They're, they're the same. They really are. It's just a representation on the map rather than a table of numbers. 
Um, it's really no more complicated than that. So um, I just wanted to point that out to folks. And there's a lot of help in IFTDIS. If this is new to you, you can go in there and, and do some reading on, on how this all works. Uh, this is the compare weather module in IFTDIS. And it's um, if I did three of those different runs that I just showed you in IFTDIS, say the low, the moderate, and the high for my prescription, we have a compare weather um, function where it allows you to look at them next to each other, which is a really nice way to compare um, very easily, very quickly. And then you can start to see what happens. In this case, we're looking at flame length again. Um, what happens to my flame length visually, uh, spatially, when I change my inputs here down in the fuel moisture department. That's really the big, and the wind, those are the two biggies. So that's the compare weather in IFTDIS. Um, then when you go to the element 11 and 16, this is the organization equipment and holding. Um, you know, this is the, another way just to use the basic module in IFTDIS. This isn't the more advanced spread model. This is just the basic, same as behave again. But again, I can look at this on the map. This is a burn unit. The green line on here is the forest boundary. This is down on the Sawtooth, south of Twin Falls. And uh, you can see, now I can look, what is my distance to my boundary and what am I dealing with rate of spread? So I can identify problem areas, you know, if I'm, if I'm trying to stick all this on a map. So again, this is just the basic fire behavior spread, uh, model in IFTDIS similar to behave. Um, so if you have values in you, now you wanna see See, it's spatially represented. Where would I have issues with rate of spread outside of my burn unit? And then finally, a little more advanced, like I talked about doing something with contingency planning, and I know Jen and Wes are going to talk about this further, but is looking at our uh, the fire spread model in IFTDIS, which is the low, moderate, high idea with a prescription, and looking at what happens if I get a spot fire. Um, so this, again, is a spread model. This is a little more advanced if you're not um, as, as skilled in this, this might be something you might want some help with, with an LTAN or an FBAN that, that locally or, or to do some extra reading or have someone review your outputs. Um, but this is one way to represent that using IFTDIS. And uh, I think it does a pretty good idea at taking those same prescription parameters and, and gaming out what, what issues you might have um, in a contingency type of plan. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. Let's stop and if there's anybody that has any questions, and then we're going to move on and let Jen talk about how she's using this in, in Yosemite. Any thoughts? And we can, we'll have some time for discussion at the end too. So, um, anything, Jen, you see? I think we're good, right? Yeah, no, we're, we're good. Um, oh, Craig just uh, raised his hand. Craig, go ahead. Yeah, so um, quick question, um, maybe two questions. Um, so I was always taught um, many years ago that if you have a fuel model that's less than 10% in your burn unit to, to not model that, um, you know, I don't know if other people do that as well, um, but is there a way in IFTDIS to tell the algorithm that, you know, if something isn't, you know, I saw some fractions of percents in there and 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 things like that. Is that really affecting overall rate of spread? And is it going to, you know, you had a lot of different fuel models shown in your in your table. Um, that's one question. The other question is. Um, what type of so in, in relating it to behave? What type of two model or two plus fuel model runs? are being utilized with the spread? Is it a you know, two-dimensional where it hits one band and hits another? Is it taking the two, two, two fuel models and mixing them together so it's now a contiguous set of two fuel models? Uh, is that, can the user input that and, and specify that? Okay, help me, sorry, help me understand your last, oh, let's see your last question first. Restate that one, if you don't mind. The two fuel models, I'm, I'm not tracking with you, just. So, so in, in BEHAVE, when we do two fuel models, you can say, well, they're bands of fuels, so they're not, they're not intermixed. And so BEHAVE is going to run one fuel model for one band and then another band and, and kind of give you that, that, that output versus taking two fuel models, squishing them together, and then having BEHAVE run that model as if it's dealing with two separate fuels in one footprint. And so I'm wondering what 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 
what option is if this using in that so regard. That, okay, I, I'm I'm following you. So you know, behave is just taking the fuel model. For example, we've got in this case this behave output. We have gr three, right? And we're getting a service spread of twenty three chains per hour. So it just said it has no spatial representation at all in behave. It's just saying for that type of fuel model anywhere in the world, um, under these inputs, that's how fast the the fire would spread. IFTDIS is taking this, the same thing, but it's looking at a 30 meter pixel essentially. And in land fire, it's identified that 30 meter pixel as, um, you know, as perhaps it's a GR, it is a GR3. Um, so it's running, all it is it's, it's doing, it, it, the pixels are not interacting on if, in IFTDIS because um, this is not a spread model. It's only identifying, it's just taking that same 23 chains per hour from behave, but now it's just showing it on the pixel that's representing it um, from land fire for that fuel model. So it's not blending any fuel models or anything like that. It's literally one fuel model per pixel. Does that okay. make sense? It, it, it does. I, I think, um, yeah. So I think with the behave two, two model, you can say, okay, 60% of the unit is one one fuel and forty percent is the other, um, and it and it does some kind of computation to to give a, a final rate of spread. Um, right, and it's but it's only giving a rate of spread for each individual pixel. It's not. This is like I said, where I'm not talking about a spread model here. We're keeping it very basic. It, it's still not blending. I think is the takeaway correct. from that. That okay. is correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mike, you got some input or some a quick question? Uh, just a quick question what and see what your thoughts are. Just redid two burn plans for the new, uh, you know, under the new template. And we need to update some things and was using empty disk for the first time, which was nice, a little bit of a learning curve. But one of the issues I ran into was the fuel models out of land fire versus what we've traditionally used on the ground. Primarily, mm -hmm. we're in Ponderosa. And I'm not talking so much like open Ponderosa where the grass is the carrier, but like a TL8 and, and no TL8 show up in the, in the land fire uh -huh. data under IFTDIS and just it was, you know, really different fuel models and a lot of them. Yep. Like was just said, um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. And this is a topic I think we want to go we could spend, and I think we're planning on spending a whole session just talking about editing. So in your right on, when you get your land fire data, the first thing you should always do is critique it, is it doesn't match what I know is on the ground. You know, land fire is a great representation of what we have initially, but we always need to make adjustments based on what we know is out there. So just like you said, and there's some simple tools in IFTDIS to go in and say, Hey, that TLA, and Wes is going to talk about this. This is actually quite an important part from the lost dispenses report. Um, what's representing on the ground versus what land fire is showing needs to be adjusted. So I need to go in there and say, hey, land fire, you said you're TLA. Well, I actually know you're more of a, you know, either maybe you're more of a grass model, a faster spreading grass model. So I'm going to change you TLA. I'm going to change you to a GR2. And you can do that in Nifty Disk, so you can make sure it represents your reality on the ground. And there's some simple tools to do that in Nifty Disk, and that's a very important step in doing any of this fire behavior yeah. modeling. Yeah, and, and I, I think did, we did. Go ahead. I was going to say I did change, like it had basically TU5 for all the Pondo, and I changed that to the TL8. But I, when you start looking across the landscape and all the different fuel models it has and stuff. Um, you know, it's hard to correct some of that. And then if it's a more complex fuels, you're kind of like, well, you know, what do we got here? And so I. It, it's I, a great. I don't, I don't a, know what to say exactly. Yeah, no, no. It's, know, a good I, exercise. It anyway. it's a great exercise to go through. It's absolutely necessary. And you would do it anyway if you were using behave, right? Because you need to know which fuel models you're going to punch right. into the behave system, right? I got to pick the right ones. And it's the same thing. If you're looking at that represented on the map in IFTDIS and you go, mm, no, that's not right. I know, you know, I know we've got more grass except, you know, up in, up in this corner, which is going to change my fire behavior. So I need to change that and make it represent reality. 
and uh, land fire, the new land fire data does a pretty good job of representing what's out there, but there's always going to need to be some adjustments. Yeah. And that's okay, and a standard then, step in any sort of spatial analysis. Yep. Then one last question, this may be outside your lane, but we have those adjusted land fire fuel models and a bunch of other analysis from the coal uh, project in Colorado that they did. Okay, you know, yeah, contracted yes. out. Yep. I know, you know what, what I'm talking, talking about. about. Yep, I do. Yep. Um, do you think that is that seems like you know the best science data, etc. Yep. At the time, if that could be loaded into um, IPTI disk for Colorado or yes, <laughs> I just got that question from Sarah Sinowick actually not too long ago, and we were talking with Henry Bastian from Landfire and uh, and the IPTI disk team about we know there's some other layers like that that are out there uh, for different states. And uh, we are talking about ways to get those made available somehow in IFTDIS. So it's definitely on the radar. We realize it's a, it's a, it's a thing that would save a lot of people a lot of time. Um, not that you, you still need to critique it, but, um, but yes, I, I, we, our desire is to get that in there at some point. They're not there now, but we're hoping to be able to do that. Okay, thank you. You bet, great questions. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and stop and turn things over to Jen and let her walk through some of her examples that she, how she uses some of this stuff in Yosemite. Jen, just holler at me to swap slides for you. Okay, great. Yeah, if you're gonna keep trying, that's great. I'll turn on my camera for just a second, just to say hi um, and introduce myself. I'm Jen Anderson and I'm the division chief for prescribed fire and fuels at Yosemite National Park. And, um, I've been using Nifty Disc for a while. I used it when I worked in the Southeast and then also here in California. So had a lot of uh, uh, great opportunities to, to use it. So I'm gonna share a few of those with you today. So I'll turn off my camera just so I don't get draggy or anything <laughs> with the internet. All right, so like I said, I'm gonna show you a few examples using Nifty Disc uh, to, for our prescribed fire planning process here at Yosemite National Park. And um, it's in just three examples. One would be burn prioritization, um, how we use it with compliance. And then lastly, uh, but not least, how we use it to um, help us with our burn plan preparation. Next. Oh, whoops, sorry. <laughs> Things jumping ahead on me. I'm sorry about that, Jen. <laughs> now you have to go back one now. <laughs> All right, so first we'll talk about how to use uh, if you just, uh, for burn plan prioritization. Uh, and, you know, there's multiple ways you can do this, but here uh, at the park, we, we use a multiple stage process and part of it uses if you just, and part of it doesn't. Um, so, so one thing we look at is FRID, the fire return interval departure, just to kind of see where we are in the landscape, how far departed um, the landscape is from its natural interval. And then we use um, it, we use IFTDIS to look at integrated hazard, which basically uh, is running models and uses that landscape file, the topography, vegetation, fuel models, weather, ignitions, and then also a wildfire simulation. And then from there, it assigns that integrated hazard based on the burn probability model and the conditional flame length. So you can kind of see on this map, those colors, they go from like a really cool blue all the way up to a red and it just shows you where that, that high hazard is. Um, you can also see I've, I've highlighted two areas in the park that we're gonna look at today, um, which also kind of are, are coincidentally red <laughs> on both of these parts of the model. Um, <clears throat> so then next. I'm sorry, next. It's, it's lagging on me again. Oh no, that's okay. I don't know why it gets stuck. <laughs> well, I'll keep talking a little bit. So really, so the probability model looks at that probability of a fire occurring under specific conditions and the intensity at that specific point given the fire occurs. So just a little kind of sidebar on what the burn probability model does. And now, okay, now we're at our next steps. So then um, another step we use, um, if you just for, is to look at where our highly valued resource and assets are on the landscape. Uh, so such things such as wooey, your endangered, endangered species habitat. Uh, here we have giant square groves, um, invasive species. Those are just to name a few. Um, and if you just have some reference layers that's, that are preloaded, but you can also upload your own layers. So that's really useful. Um, and we, we do that here. 
Uh, and then the next step would be to look at what I call approved units. So, you know, a unit that has a burn plan, a current burn plan that's approved, um, is the compliance done on it? You know, is the survey, are all the surveys completed um, and is that unit prepped? So that just kind of gives us another, that one doesn't give us much weight, but that's part of that process. And then lastly, Sorry. It's no, 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 it's okay. I can, I can do a drum roll for the... Uh... <laughs> can you see the next one, where to burn? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just pause and, and continue speaking when I see it. So, um, so lastly, like, so looking at combining that, that fire return and departure, the integrated hazard, the HVRAs and the approved units, this is kind of shows us where we want to burn. Uh, and so this goes into our multi-year fuel plan. And what that is in the park service, we're required by policy to have a multi-year fuel plan that looks at the next five years uh, of, of places we can burn. And of course we update that annually, which is a nice thing in if you just, cause you can go in and update the landscape. Like let's say you have a wildfire or you burned um, different units or other things change on the landscape. You can go in and up, make those updates, rerun the models, and then you have an, another um, you, you can update your fuel plan with that. Oh, there is. Ah, stop. <laughs> All right. So then I wanted to show you an example. Um, this was uh, kind of a, a, a you know, a neat thing that happened. Well, neat thing. I shouldn't say that about a fire, but just an example of looking at the burn probability uh, from empty disks with with the burn units that we chose and um, the Washburn fire, which uh, is, a, is a pretty large wildfire that we had this, this year. So this is really showing you the, the real world effect translated to, through the burn probability model. So on the right there is, you can kind of see those units, um, they're uh, kind of a faded green color. And then that big outline red is the Washburn fire. So you can see where, you know, it showed a higher probability uh, it, from, from the model in IFTDIS in that area. So it just was kind of cool that it aligned. Um, and, and we had areas proposed to, to burn in that area, although we hadn't got to them yet. So now one of our units is taken care of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Not a bad and, thing sometimes. Right, right. And then now we'll use the black to, to burn other areas around um, in this area as well. But, and then next. Okay, sorry, I'm getting there. Oops, I guess those are your... Okay. Yeah, and this is just showing some area, like just the back one, um, it just shows with the little flames, areas on the landscape where the probability is lower. And those are areas where we have treated in the past. So it's, it's just kind of showing again, that real world effect. Uh, so, it, you know, when you're using models, it, it's important to test their accuracy. Uh, and so this example allowed us to do that uh, in this area. Okay, so second part is um, how we use IFTDIS with compliance. Uh, and this was something that um, has been really useful for us here. Um, it's, it's allowed us to actually increase our burn windows. Um, so, it's, it, so while it's a widely agreed that prescribed fire is needed to reduce the risk of, wild, of high severity wildfire in fisher habitat, fisher is a Pacific fisher is one of our endangered species. I guess I should start out with that. Um, so we all agree that, but there was a lot of uncertainty what the fire effects would be. So by using the fire behavior models in IFUDIS and, um, and then very well describing what we're doing and what those outputs were, we, we, we were able to paint that picture of how fire behavior um, reacts on the, on the landscape, like a, a, a burn, like a, a burn prescription compared to a wildfire prescription and the effects that it would have to that habitat, would, what, what it would have. So. Moving here, this, this is showing the results um, out of IFTDIS using that basic model in an area where it was um, some compliance that we had done in an area where there was fisher habitat. And what this is showing you is the flame links um, on the left, the low intensity with a low intensity uh, pr prescribed fire prescription um, versus uh, the flame links on the right, which would be high, maybe a wildfire situation. So I put these in the, with the compliance document um, and explain this to the Fish and Wildlife Service in order to, again, show kind of what, you know, how these low intensity shows more like a mosaic pattern and it's, and it's gonna be more of a beneficial thing for the fisher and is also meeting our objectives and our burn plan.
Real quick, Jan, just to cross the uh, the language barrier between agencies, just to, for clarification, compliance in the park service world is akin to or similar to wildlife consultation, Endangered Species Act, and all the NEPA that we do on our side. Yes, thank you, Jen. Yeah, I probably should have been a little bit more <laughs> clear on it's that. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> Which is basically, yeah, doing NEPA. Um, and, and I think even states have some compliance. But yeah, for us, it's, you know, Section 7 consultation. Um, doing uh, SHPO, which is the the, the um, it's a state historical preservation act, and then tribal consultation. So it's a it's a big um, like yeah. three, three different it's a three step process for us. It may be a little slightly different for other agencies. This is what you'd put into a burn specialist report, contributing to you know supporting or maybe poking a hole in some of your alternatives of NEPA. Yes. Yes. And so this is just um, the the first slide was. Uh, the flame length and this is just showing you rate of spread same thing you know just uh, you can see that that spatial representation and then also you have those graphs too so you can kind of show the percentage of of what kind of fire behavior you would have on the landscape and not only within your unit but also outside your unit which is really important and so prior to using if you this we were using the behave outputs and um, it just wasn't quite having the same effect in our communication with our with our local biologists and with the Fish and Wildlife Service, who we do Section Seven consultation with. So having those maps and actually showing them the, the spatial representation was also was being used a little bit, having a little bit better um, reaction for that. And then lastly, for this is uh, one of the critical habitat elements for the fisher is canopy cover. So again, by illustrating it spatially in the map using these fire behavior models, um, on the left, you can see on the landscape where there's, you know, surface, either, either it stays on the surface or you have passive or active uh, ground fire. So in this instance, you know, using the, the pres prescription, it doesn't have any active, it has surface fire and some passive. Um, and then again, on the right, what we were using before um, are the outputs from behave, which again, um, with using the spatial models um, allows us to have that better communication with our biologists and our partners um, from the fire behavior results for our burning. So with uh, with all that, you know, we know that we use prescribed fire to reduce the surface fuels and with with the, with the spatial fire behavior modeling, it allows us to model that surface fire across the landscape under different prescriptions. And then also using that probabilistic model that that you know that burn probability model that I showed earlier, um, that helped us you know assist us in where to apply those prescri prescribed fire treatments. Um, and so we also do other monitoring to to accompany the spatial modeling with with uh, on the ground habitat monitoring. We have GPS collaring and stuff like that. But I guess what I'm trying to tell you is that by doing all the, the extra modeling and, and expl explanation of the spatial fire behavior models, we were able to get a determination for a may affect not likely to adversely affect. And those of you that work with compliance probably understand that language. Um, <laughs> basically that what we're doing is not gonna, you know, make this the species go, go extinct or anything. Um, the other part of it in the Southern Sierra Nevada Fisher Conservation Strategy, one of the goals is that um, additional models should be developed to help highlight areas where prescribed fire and use of wildland fire are priority management tools. Uh, so we did that. I mean, we, we use different models to help highlight those areas. So by, again, using IFTDIS, we were, you know, helping meet these strategies and goals outlined in this, in this conservation strategy. All right, Jen, let me get to the next one here. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so lastly, um, we're going to talk a little bit how to use if you just in burn plan development. And, um, you know, Kim talked about uh, some, some elements that you can use when uh, in if you just when, when developing your burn plan for 7, 11, 16, and 17, those elements. But um, I was just going to talk a little bit more how we use it almost even before we, we start writing the burn plan. So, so you know, I know there's a lot of talk out there, people and, and about using like unit level burn plans versus landscape level plans. And, uh, and I think that a lot of people are moving to that landscape level. So 
before you do that, you need to make sure that, you know, when you do that complexity analysis, that, you know, you're, you're, you're working on under the same complexity. So, you know, here we use if you just to assist uh, with that, you can start using it with in the complexity analysis, looking at your values, risk and difficulty. So you can use that map studio and look at some of where your values are. Um, and then, but what I'm going to focus on for this is how we use the, the fire behavior portion for element seven. Uh, and then, so I'll go ahead and move to the next one. So the first one is um, the a burn unit level plan. So um, this is just showing you that, like, let's say you're just looking at the fire behavior portion of it. And so you can look at this spatially on the landscape and say, you know what, can I, you know, we, we were actually writing a burn plan for each individual unit here. This is actually the Mariposa Grove. The units range from like 14 acres to 158 acres. So that's 14 units, that's 14 burn plans. <laughs> so do you need to write 14 burn plans? You know, and you know, again, I know that a lot more goes into the complexity analysis, but again, just focusing on this, you know, on the left, we're looking at flame length, on the right, rates of spread. And to me, you know, yeah, we can probably combine these um, or, or start thinking about wh whether or not we can combine these just based on looking at, uh, at these outputs. So then zooming out just a little bit more, um, this would be, you know, the landscape level plan. Um, this includes um, that grove area we just talked about kind of in the, you know, bottom right there. Um, it includes that, but it includes eight larger units. Um, so now we're talking 8,000 acres. Um, is this doable? You know, maybe maybe not all eight of these, uh, maybe that one that's showing kind of that red, more red in the middle there, maybe that's not a good one to include in this. But I think you can see where I'm going with this is that this is just a tool that you can help, helps you look at these fire behavior outputs on a larger scale. And then lastly, we'll look at even one more step larger. Uh, I don't know how many people have, have heard about pods, but I feel like, um, it's been around long enough that these potential operational wildland fire delineation units, um, some people used to, you know, they're kind of so much like a fire shed back in the day, but it's just even a larger landscape where um, these, these pods are pre-identified um, by looking at roads and rivers and ridges, and, and we're starting to use them a lot more in the, in the wildland community, but I'm starting to see it trickle into the, the prescribed fire community too. And so if we're, I mean, if we're already using them for wildfire, why, why shouldn't we use them for prescribed fire? So you can see here, again, you're even zooming out more. And so these are just three pods and um, they range from 5,000 to 30,000 acres. So, you know, is it something that you can, you know, write a burn plan for that? And so again, by looking at it just from the fire behavior perspective, this kind of gives you that, that idea. <clears throat> so there's there's various tools out there to develop our prescriptions. Um, you know, some of them, you know, kind of going off this of climatology. You know, you can use Fire Family Plus. Look at your climatology. Um, you can you can enter your prescription ranges into Fire Family Plus and see how many days you're in prescription. Um, you can use um, IFTDIS and Behave to look at your low and high intensity uh, prescriptions. I know some people do you like a low and ideal and a high? I mean, there's there's various ways you can look at that, but here we just use low and high. Um, and then of course the fire behavior modeling, uh, again, just looking at, uh, at what kind of results you're getting to meet your objectives using either behavior or if you so, so Kim touched on this earlier, um, using that compare weather. Uh, this is, is, is pretty useful. You can run uh, two different weather scenarios uh, or using two different, using comparing two different prescriptions. Um, again, using that spatial landscape. So, you know, all those landscape features, topography, um, fuel models uh, are used at a, that predetermined pixel level, which it starts out at 30 meter, but you can always change that based on how large your landscape is. Um, and you can view these outputs side by side. Um, and this is just showing you a screenshot of the flame length, um, but you all can also can look at rate of spread and, and fire line intensity. And then so then like for using behave, 
um, if you're trying to do that kind of same thing, you can only use multiple variables for two values at a time. So you'd have to rerun a bunch of different scenarios to kind of get the same outputs. Um, and then also you wouldn't have them spatially on the screen like that. Um, but one feature that is, is nice and behave is that table that shows those acceptable fire conditions, which is, I'm sure people have used, but that, that's also a, a nice feature. And then lastly is contingency and, and how, how you can use uh, the different fire behavior models uh, to determine, determine what contingency resources you may need. So on the left, you can see IFTDIS. Um, this is actually looking at that minimum travel time that Kim talked about, that fire spread. And you can also use the basic, which I don't have in this, this screenshot. Um, and, and just to kind of get an idea of if you were to have issues outside the unit, and what I did in this scenario is I created uh, points of ignition. There's different ways you can do it. Wes is gonna show you another way, um, but we, our prevailing winds are out of the Southwest. So I thought, hey, there's probably gonna be an issue here. So I just did multiple ignitions to kind of get an idea. Um, so then using those rates of spread, then applying them to the production tables. Um, and then you can look at different combinations of resource using the production tables to figure out you know, what it is that you'll need for that contingency. Um, and then it's it's just much more powerful to show the potential on a map versus um, uh, you can also use the contain model in behave. So I guess in summary, you know, just if you just has been really useful to for us in our prescribed fire planning process. Uh, I've shared with you these these couple of examples, but um, these are just a few, and and I know there's there's probably tons more that I could share with you, but um, maybe on another one. But uh, that's all I had for today. Awesome, Jen. Yeah, it's always nice to have, to see this in action. And uh, a lot of people ask, you know, how do I take these and then put them into my actual document? And that's a great question. And I know a lot of people put this into the appendix for that documentation um, part, which is fine. I've seen people embed these in their actual page, you know, like at the contingency plan, they have their discussion and they put an image in just like this showing their, you know, critical holding points, for example. So there's lots of ways you can take these outputs then and put them into your actual plan. Or even like Jen was talking about with her NEPA um, sort of compliance work, same thing, taking those inputs and putting them, or those outputs and putting them actually into the, the NEPA document or the, you know, if you're doing the, the fuel specialist report for one of those ID teams, again, just inserting those images into the, into the body of the text can really help a reader as they're reading through, you know, rather than having to flip the appendix, they can just read, look at the screenshot with the caption and then keep going on. It kind of brings the story together often. So that's another great topic that I like to talk about is how do we actually take these then and utilize them in our documents? And maybe that's something we can talk about in another session as well. So I wanna shift gears now and turn things over to Wes Hall. And if you guys keep throwing stuff into the chat, we will have some time to discuss after Wes is done too on any of these topics. Um, so yeah, I want to turn it over to Wes. Wes, again, was part of the review for Lost Dispensis and, uh, and did a lot of work using some of these spatial tools to dig into what happened there and what we can learn from that. So take it away, Wes. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, just to introduce myself real quick. My name is Wesley Hall. I work for um, the Wildfire Management RDNA um, like Kim does. I am not on detail like she is, though, so I, <laughs> I am here with the RDA. My primary job with the RDA is actually the development of next generation of WUFTIS. Um, but for uh, this specific project, I was brought in as a subdramatic expert um, as an LTAN uh, to look at the fire behavior and some of the modeling that was done in the planning of the lost dispenses um, escaped prescribed fire. And I'm going to focus today mostly on the learning aspect of that escape, um, not so much of about you know what may have gone right or wrong we will touch on a few things but more more so than anything just showing how tools and especially if this as a tool um, can help inform some of the potential and some of the consequences that they saw um, as you can see um, by that image on the screen that is uh well was the lost dispenses prescribed fire um, over on the, the left hand side, you can see there's a little low ridge before you get into that rocky area, which is actually wilderness boundary. 
Um, but I wanted to show this picture because it really shows the complexity of the terrain and the complexity of the fuels and the, uh, the entire environment for this specific uh, prescribed fire. Let's jump to the next slide. OK, uh, a little background. I'm going to briefly kind of go over what happened the day of the escape, and this will be from my perspective as, like I said, one of the SMEs on the review team as we interviewed the participants in the burn organization on site during that day and some of the things they conveyed to me. Um, so please um, keep that in mind as I go through here. Um, this map that I'm showing here on the screen, and actually I want to back up. Um, at, after this presentation, we'll share the PowerPoint. And for folks that may, um, you can stay on that same slide, Kim. Folks that may want to see the Guyanese Lost Dispenses Prescribed Fire Declared Wildfire Review, um, that link on the upper left is hyperlinked, so you can go straight to the document there um, on the Lessons Learned site. Um, but back to the map. Um, so you can see kind of uh, in the center of this burn unit 10, there's that red outline, okay? That's where they initiated their test fire and they initiated at 11.34 a.m. with the goal of not burning the entire unit the first day, but only the northern portion of the unit, which was along some critical holding line. Um, so you see that hand line that kind of circles along the green there. Um, that green polygon that's inside the line that represents um, line prep fuels that they had previously prepped the line and had actually a contract crew pre prep the line and pulled all of that fuel that they took off that hand line in interior into the burn. OK, so they started that test fire, like I said, at 1134 in the morning um, at 1335. They had their first spot fire, which is that bigger spot fire kind of on that left hand side there. Yep, right there. Um, no, no concerns there. You know, in the southwest, uh, spotting is is very probable and very often, especially with prescribed fire. And I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of frame the fire season too a little bit while I'm here, um, and talk a little bit about the, you know, what was going on. So southwest um, spring burning is is very um, difficult at times to begin with and burn windows are often very short and you kind of have to look for these windows of opportunity when they pr present themselves. So they chose um, the specific day April 6th of this year to burn this unit. Um, it was on the tail end of a, a leaving um, low pressure front where they had um, red flag warnings and then they had potential for red flag warnings a few days later um, within that same area. Um, but that's not uncommon down here. There's plenty of days that I've done burning, implemented burning um, either right after or right before uh, a red flag event. So it's not anything out of the ordinary for us. Um, primary fuels they were burning is mixed conifer and ponderosa pine. Um, but uh, back to kind of that timeline, uh, like I said, that that first spot fire at 1335, um, they were able to get around that, no issues. They continued burning into that kind of that dog leg, so to speak, kind of on that upper north piece of the burn with that horseshoe. So we had a horseshoe of fuels that were that were prep fuels <clears throat> that they were starting to burn into. Um, at 1606, they had multiple spots over the line kind of on that eastern side there, and um, they were not able to get around all of the spots. They had some interior torching, um, which caused a lot of those spots to continue to grow. And then by 1634, um, that upper spot, um, to the right there, yeah, that became pretty established, and that's when they went ahead and with concurrence for the line officer, they declared it a wildfire uh, so they could get extra resources on scene and try to get it the following day. Um, after that happened, and this is beyond, beyond the purview of the wildfire review, but after that happened, um, unfortunately, it was that area in New Mexico um, had some very severe, uh, I would say critical wildfire um, kind of environment that we typically don't see. They had well over 30 days of continuous red flag warnings and red flag conditions um, leading to days after the escape. And none of that was really um, forecasted prior to, like I said, they did have a chance for um, some red flag conditions after the burn, but nobody knew that it was going to last as long as it did. So that turned into the Hermix Peak Fire, um, which burned for quite some time this spring. We can uh, let's go to the well, I, I want to talk about the picture real quick. So that 1618 picture, you know, that's really 
where um, if you back up one more one slide back. Um, that picture on the left, that's that's kind of in that transition phase where they started getting spots across the line and started started seeing some holding problems um, right before they declared the wildfire escape. But as you can see with the smoke, you know, the winds were not significant. They didn't see significant winds on site. It was merely a, mostly a, a fuels driven environment. Let's go to the next one. OK, um, so the, I pulled some of the critical findings out of the report, and like I said, everybody, I would encourage everybody to um, read the report and look at what was found. But the, the the key thing there is that number one, you know, all elements were consistent with agency policy and guidelines guidance outlined in the in the um, PMS 44 um, and the PMS 424, um, and so they were not outside of their scope in terms of burning. They followed all of their their burn plan. They followed their complexity rating. Um, every all the T's were crossed and all the I's were dotted, so to speak. Um, and then I put in some of the other um, nuanced critical findings associated with fuels. But for today, I'm going to focus on those three um, bottom bullets that are bolded. So I'm going to talk about fuel models that may have not have been adequately represented in the development of the burn plan, which will be they used 8, 9, 10, and 11. They used the 13 fuel models, which is okay. We often do that down here in the Southwest. Um, we're going to talk about no spatial analysis of the fire behaviors was used. Um, Again, that's not required by any means, and I'm not trying to allude that it is required, uh, but spatial fire analysis definitely could have showed them that they could have had problems. And then finally, I'm going to talk about uh, suppression resources, holding and contingencies that were not calculated adequately. Oops, line. go ahead and click on it again. Hey, no, that, that was going to happen. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, I had a last minute change. I made a presentation and it kind of mucked it up. Um, but basically, I wanted to show the fuel models that they had represented in the burn plan. Um, they identified dry mix conifer as fuel model 10, which is about 33% of the unit. Wetter mix conifer as fuel model 8, which is another 30%. Um, and then Ponderosa pine at 21%, which they used fuel model 9, which is very common. And then they used dry mix conifer with slash to represent those prep fuels as fuel model 11. Let's move on from there. So those were the initial fuel models. Now in the review process, um, click again, please, Kim. Um, we we did pull uh, land fire fuels to look at what was represented in the unit. And we did this for one specific reason. When we were on site uh, during the, the field trip, so to speak, where the burn organization kind of recreated those events of what happened that day, um, Everybody in that area kind of talked about this, the fact that there was more grass than they had seen in previous years. Now this was coming off of a monsoon season um, for much of New Mexico that was either average or above average. I believe up there in the northern portion of the state, it was around average, um, but we had a bad winter and we didn't have a lot of snowpack. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't a, it was kind of a below average winter and we had an early season melt off of that snow. And so the snowpack really didn't have an effect of pushing down those grass fuels. Um, so you can see um, when I pulled the land fire fuel models and looked at the area and now this is a raw pull from land fire. I did not do any editing to it and I do support the fact and notion of editing your fuel models where appropriate, but you can see there that that turquoise color is represented by a fuel model two and fuel model two uh, for those i'm pretty sure everybody here is very familiar with it you know it represents that open um, uh, pine type stand with a lot of grass understory where the grass is a primary carrier of the fuel and this unit prior to them implementing the prescribed burn had been pretty heavily mechanically thinned and they had open canopies which allowed that grass to come in and and reflect that and so we did identify that fuel model two could have been a contributing factor because there was a significant amount of grass loading on the unit prior to the burn um, and, and it definitely had an impact on their rates of spread and their flame length and i'll show that next so let's switch to the next slide again okay so this is a compare compare fuel model chart um, looking at flame length specifically and you can see the, the yellow, the teal, the red, and the pink. Those are the fuel models that they included in the burn plan prescription, all appropriate. 
um, all are the same fuel models I would have done as well. But if they had the chance to look at the the fuel spatially and pull up that land fire fuel model data set in nifty disk, they may have seen that potential for fuel model two and fuel model two um, definitely has higher flame lengths um, given the same same inputs there. So I wanted to highlight that and then the next one. Oh, whoops, it looks like it went behind your slide oh, it there. it went behind. Bummer. Well, mm -hmm. I was going to show rate of spread, um, and it basically shows the same thing. Fuel Model 2 definitely has a higher rate of spread uh, than the other fuel models that they included in the burn plan. So as a learning aspect on this whole thing, um, utilizing IFTDIS and spatial tools to kind of give you an idea of what fuel models might be available on your unit. You know, if they had the chance to look at those fuels, they may have seen that a fuel model too, and then did some ground truthing to determine whether or not that fuel model would indeed impact uh, their prescribed fire plans. Well, let's go to the next slide. Okay, uh, so here is uh, outputs from Behave for their prescription. Um, as you can see, fuel models eight, nine, and ten there, and you can see their their rates of spread. Um, you know, fire line intensity, flame links, that sort of thing. This is how they establish their low and their high end um, for their prescription. Um, nothing out of the ordinary here, um, very common. Um, and then jump to the next slide. And here's what it looks like recreated in FDDIS. And so with if this, you know, you have to think to yourself, what method can be used to assess fire hair potential across the fire area given a different weather <laughs> prescription scenarios, right? That's how we develop the prescription. We want to see, you know, what is our threshold where fire behavior gets too intense and we won't be able to keep the fire within the unit. Um, so the cool thing about spatial with higher behavior, and if you'll remember back when I was talking to that very first picture, when I introduce myself, you know, it's very complex terrain in this area. There's a lot of topography. There's a lot of um, local factors that influence the, the wind, the RH, the temperature. Um, it's a very complex piece of country. And from my experience, um, unfortunately, behave can't account for a lot of that complexity within the system. But if you this, because it does use the land fire um, landscape and includes slope aspect, um, your fuel moistures, your fuel models, and the complexity of the fuel models across the landscape, it gives you more of that that complexity to match up with your complex landscape um, when it's when it's available. So you can see on the left there, uh, that would be flame length, rate of spread, and then on the bottom, crown fire activity on their, their low prescription, and then under their higher prescription, um, which is similar to where they burned um, for, for several of the parameters, you can also see flame length, rate of spread, and crown fire intensity. And so I just wanted to show that because it, it does highlight some of the areas outside of the unit specifically. That northern northern piece above the units is primarily wilderness, and so you can see that within the wilderness, obviously because there has been no uh, previous treatment, there is higher uh, higher flame lengths, higher rates of spread, and more crown fire probability uh, as you leave the unit. Hey Wes, just real quick, there was, had been a question in the chat earlier about just just. Uh, maybe reviewing that one more time. So with IFTDIS, the uh, each pixel, the question was, does IFTDIS capture the aspect, the slope, the elevation within that pixel? Um, so when it calculates the fire behavior, it takes those things into account. And the answer to that is yes. And that's what Wes was just pointing out, that behave is not, a, because it's not spatial, it's not able to capture slope aspect and elevation um, like if just does so it, it does give a little better representation of of um, fire behavior given those additional pieces of the puzzle if you will um, versus behave given it's just a single fuel model um, fire behavior relationship so hope, hope that is that question yeah that's absolutely correct thank you for that kim and, and i would add to that also that landscape file that you do pull um in empty disk to run this this basic model does also include canopy characteristics and tree characteristics so you get stand height you get canopy base height you get canopy bulk density and crown cover um, which really help for the that crown fire activity modeling on the bottom there um, but it does give you a more holistic uh, view of of the scenario for each pixel yeah 
Thank you. Yeah, that. I think that's a great point. So when you're using a fuel model two that has a higher flame length and you have a canopy base height, you know, which is where the boughs of the tree, it's basically the, the height of the boughs of the tree above the ground, right? So if you have a higher flame length and you have a low canopy base height, that's why you get increased uh, crown fire potential. So, and again, if you just can capture that um, because it has those elements in the land fire data um, that it uses to, to produce the outputs here. So that's a, that's, a, that's a good way to think about it that each of those pixels in IFTDIS has all of those different pieces that allow you to look at different um, outputs related to your, uh, your normal inputs. Thanks, Kim. And Kim, yep, yeah, perfect. Okay, so finally, um, this is uh, kind of uh, the last type of uh, modeling scenario we did during the review. And this really answers, you know, your question of given a scenario where there was an escaped, escape to the plan prescribed fire unit um, with the established holding lines, what are the major paths to spread and how successful would suppression actions be in the event that that does get established outside the unit? Um, so this is the minimum travel time fire spread model in IFTDIS. Um, it's just placed on an aerial photo there. And you can see that in this case, the entire unit was used as an ignition. So rather than the way Jen explained it, where she put some spot fires in some key locations that they had concerns to see where those grow. Instead, on this one, we took that whole unit and made that whole unit active to see two things, right? We wanted to see how far it could go within an eight hours of burning. And then what were the major flow paths? Where was that fire likely to spread? And how could that have helped them for, inform that potential for escape? And so if, let's jump to the final slide and we just have. Real quick, so, just a real quick explanation. So the flow paths, just so folks are aware that this, this spread model, again, this is a spread model. So it's not just pixel by pixel, but it's spreading the model from pixel to pixel. And the flow paths are basically pointing out where is the uh, path of least resistance? Meaning where is the fuel most continuous? Uh, where is the slope aligned? Things like that. So that's why the flow paths are really useful because it, it shows you where all of those pieces come together and allow the fire to want to go that way. Think of it almost like water running downhill. This would be fire running uphill, you know, or across a, um, a slope based on where the fuels are. So that's why the flow paths are useful. Correct. Thank you, Kim. Okay, so the, I wanted to show this final um, image here, and this, the red uh, line you see above the unit, that was the, I believe it was the second day morning um, after the escape was declared, the estimated perimeter um, for the fire uh, using satellite imagery to, to, to sketch out that perimeter. We weren't able to get an actual perimeter on the fire. Um, at this time, I was actually supporting the, the forest as an LTAN, um, helping them out with their wolf discs. And, and this was prior to me even knowing that an escape actually occurred. All I knew was there was a wildfire in the landscape. Um, it was up in their wilderness and they had some they had some concerns over the next you know few weeks of where the fire was going to go. So we went in and we sketched in an initial perimeter for the folks um, to see where that fire was and where it was active. And then I overlaid that after the review process and um, just to see how accurate that MTT run could actually be. And it does line up very, very well in the areas that they did have problems in terms of that showing that potential for that upward slope movement um, into the wilderness following those major flow paths and that higher fly, fire line intensity. So I really feel like that was a uh, that was a good, you know, a good way of showing that potential uh, for spread if an escape did occur. And and that's pretty much what I have to show, to tell everybody. Um, like again, I I encourage you all to read the re the report, please. Um, it is it has a lot of good nuggets in there. Um, a lot of very skilled people were were in the review and participated in the review process and the outlining of of the findings and the recommendations and lessons learned moving forward. And ultimately, you know, like I said, this is a learning experience um, for this specific unit and for all of us, you know, as an organization and as a fire community at a whole. You know, there are tools out there that can help us, um, but things do happen. And, you know, all we have to do is kind of go back and, and reevaluate our process and our methods to ensure that we're we're taking all of the potential into account. Appreciate everybody's time. Thanks, Wes. That's great. Yeah, I think again, just 
sort of summing up everything from from our last uh, hour here, you know, thinking about you know preemptively what are the tools we can use? How can we continue to you know keep that student of fire sort of uh, thought in our head as we move forward with with planning? And I know there's some new requirements now with the uh, with the national review that came out and. Um, Again, spatial modeling is one of those tools we have in the tool chest, and uh, you know we'd like folks to to learn about it. And if there's things we can do on the IFTDIS team side of the house or the RDNA, you know those are those are things we're real interested in, in being able to help folks with. So we are here to help you guys and here to um, work with everybody so we can all do a better job in this in this world because it's it, to me it's I have huge respect for all of for all the folks that that implement these burns and, and are willing to take that risk on because it's it's definitely not, as we all know um it's exciting and it's it's something we need to be doing more of but we've got we've got to make sure we're doing our homework ahead of time so so i'll stop there jen and um we have some time for discussion i think um and we're going to make this uh um, presentation available for everybody and um, I also think what I'll do is in that same message, Jen, I'll send out a little list of places to go so you can learn more about some of this stuff. Um, so I know I put some links in the chat and sometimes those are really hard to find later on. So um, make sure we get those yarded up for everybody in an in a, in a easy place that you guys can find that stuff. Okay. Okay, well, so shifting gears, you'll notice I just did put the, the community practice link in there again in case uh, you're wanting to reference or grab some of these tools. A lot of links on that page in addition to then our recordings. If you've missed this episode or one of our previous, the recordings are getting stored there in that folder um, and we can go from there. So, Richard, let's tackle your question and then I have uh, Pascal's question in the hopper here. Uh, it's kind of a comment and a question. Um, I guess the comment with the new changes for the Forest Service anyways is particularly considering the contingency requirement changes. You know, I think we're going to have a real hard time for a lot of our folks modeling this out and actually being able to justify contingency or lack of contingency, what the models are saying, particularly given the way that these calculations were calculated so far ago and we're not doing dynamic fuel models. And I, my question is, is for example, we have a burn that's in classic GS2 boarding a line on GS3. Landfire models it as a GR1, uh, and that's not accurate, right? You know, the contingency for that requires like two hotshot crews and six engines on a 735-acre burn potential, right? We can't do that. So any advice for folks out there uh, on how to get around that and not requirement or get around it, but how we justify doing that when our science is saying one thing, but our local knowledge and experience and things like that, or we're trying to justify out not having 150 people as contingency within 30 minutes of a burn. I just see a lot of problems with that. So is there any advice that you can give folks out there that might not be F bands or have access to a known F band or LTAN? Anybody here? Thanks. Jen, I don't know if I, that sounds uh, a little in the Forest Service Policy Department, if you will. I'm not, not going to try to tackle I'll that. I'll swing it that one for you. Yeah. Um, so, so when it comes to contingency planning, the 30 minute issue, um, yeah, we're aware of it. Um, we push back hard on that, realizing that that the likelihood of having resources on most national forests within 30 minutes is a slim to none, right? So uh, most of the folks are now shifting to contingency on site, um, which will have some of its advantages and disadvantages. And I think this will be a little bit of growing pain right now for all of us in terms of figuring out how to better navigate this new requirement. But in your discussion, you did mention that you said that the outside layer there was a grass one and, and you didn't agree with that. Your local knowledge told you something different. Um, and so I think you need to also, wh whatever edits we do inside the unit, we need to also make sure we're doing those edits outside the units. And that would be my recommendation. If you're seeing different fire behavior, especially if it's a grassy fuel model, but you burn it in spring and you're, you're kind of incorporating that, that wet spring soil that maybe dumbs down the fire spread, 
make sure you're editing it that, you know, provide some some level of, of visual for that. This is really not going to run like a rapid fire uh, in the grass. It's actually going to slow and moderate or be a mosaic that you can catch up with. I, that would be my my approach is to just modify that fuel layer to better reflect what you see on the ground. Um, but it, it can't be a wild guess. It has to be at least some way, shape or form. Your assumptions that you're putting into your burn plans, just capture it in the fire behavior section of your prescription. And then again, in contingency that, yeah, it looks like grass, but it doesn't burn like grass. So we're not staffing for the grass rate of spread of resources. We're planning for, you know, a modified eight uh, resources that may or may not be needed. And that that came up in the chat too. I think um, the question was, can you in IFTDIS, if you're editing your landscape, right? Um, you, of course, you can edit the entire landscape. So I want to change my GR GR three to a GR one across my entire landscape. So yes, you can do that. You can also draw a polygon and say, I only want to change the fuel models. So in this case, I think the example would be drawing a polygon, like say outside of your unit. So like for the slide I'm showing here, perhaps this is where you had a holding, I'm looking at the low uh, prescription um, output up here right now. So say that that grass that you're talking about is outside of the burn unit and you know it's not re that's not reflected correctly. I need to change just that area to say that's a much lower spreading grass model. So in IFTDIS, you could draw a polygon and say, I only wanna change the fuels just in that area. Um, to show that that is not accurate and it's really a low spreading GR1. So you could make that edit within a polygon um, just in that spot on your map. And then, then you could run your model and show that, well, we know that this is what the fuels are out there. And I can show you that based on this calculation, um, the, the spread rate is quite a bit lower than, uh, than what's showing in, the, in the, the raw data. So you know that's sort of that back and forth um, you can use with these models is, is making those edits as appropriate and then rerunning the model to, to say, or perhaps you're, you're able to go in there and do some mechanical treatment ahead of the burn. You know, say it is a, a taller grass and you're going to go in and mow or whatever. You can say, well, before we do the mitigation, and this could go back to your complexity analysis as well, you know, before we mitigate, this is the fire behavior, but we're going to go in and mitigate and do some sort of little mechanical treatment action and that's how, that's why the fire behavior outside of the unit is going to be a lot, a lot more reduced, hence needing fewer contingency resources. So yeah. that's, a, that's an exercise that can be done as well, showing that mitigation effort or just showing what you know is, is really reality on the ground. Hopefully that helps a little. I think that's a great explanation for sure. Um, and kind of on the heels just, of that earlier, hold on, Jen. Earlier, there was a question about integrating facts into the land fire layer. You know, on the Forest Service side, we have a requirement that has a spatial uh, layers, if you will, for all of our activities. And I've got Henry in the room. And so he's our land fire guru right now. Um, I guess I'd reach out to Henry uh, Bastian and ask, uh, Henry, is there any intent to start, I guess, gut checking some of the land fire layers with the fact spatial and activity codes? So it's a great question, Jen, and I maybe just to build on, you know, the comment about GR1 versus GSXYZ. Um, you know, Landfire does accept feedback. So in addition to what Kim is saying, hey, you know, do these adjustments. Definitely you can do that because it will take some time. But in addition to that, just don't wait and say, oh, I'm not too happy with Landfire, blah, 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 you know go ahead and send that type of feedback in so that land fire can adapt and become better. So um, now moving to your facts um, comment. Um, so facts that are part of land fire. Um, we, we are currently not in the process of, you know, taking all of that extra, what I'll call extra attribute um, data that you're talking about, Jen, um, and working through the process of deconflicting that, but that is on the radar. Um, you know, Jim Minakis and I have talked about how to more fully leverage what is in FACTS because um, there's a ton of information, um, you know, within FACTS. And so it is on the radar. It's currently, you know, where we're at currently right now, we take, you know, all of the polygon, you know, data and information that is in FACTS and bring that in. We then also take some of that attribute data that helps um, with the ranking, the hierarchical ranking of where do particular um, disturbances fall within the update process to say, okay, well, 
this particular disturbance and it takes precedence over you know this type of disturbance because um, you got to think through that logic and the ecology of how um, different you know uh, changes on the landscape will affect um, you know not only the vegetation but ultimately the fuels and you know the resultant fire behavior that, that we see so um, maybe not the full answer what you're looking for but um, like I said it, it is definitely on the radar of what we're working on great Jen Anderson, you got something quick before we got yeah, just left here. just just real quick, um, just for what Richard said, you know, I, I've worked in a lot of grass fuel models, too, and, and the models do commonly over predict them. And that's where, you know, monitoring comes in, having a FEMO, having monitoring and using that data that you collect from that burn and putting that back into the models and kind of going off what Jen Croft said of adjusting that stuff. Um, not, don't just go with the answer of what the model gives you because it isn't always correct. You have to kind of tweak it sometimes. Good. Richard, let's get your question in the room. All right, uh, good morning. Hey, Kim, this question's for you. Um, is, are there any plans to integrate a uh, sort of map print feature similar to what's in the RMA dashboard into Iftidus so you can get like georeference PDFs based on the map studio or JPEGs or, or you know, stuff of that nature? You know, we don't we don't have anything on the list just yet, Richie, but if, uh, you know, if that's something that folks would find really helpful so you could take these and take them in the field with you or something like that. Um, you know, we could certainly get that on our kind of request list for the future. So, so no, you could do the screen capture thing and, you know, you'd have to manipulate it to get it to be geo-referenced, but, um, but that's something we could think about for sure, if that would be a useful feature. Yeah, I mean, it's something I like in the dashboard. And one other question I have for you is, all right, so you referenced earlier talking about integrating some like state level, um, like, uh, data, landscape data, uh, kind of that might be something that could complement or contrast against the land fire data. Um, for the BLM stuff that I'm looking at, you know, and now that we have the 12 million acre uh, landscape uh, limit, you know, I can look at some field office level landscapes. Mm -hmm. And what I'm seeing is, is some of the alternatives that we have for rangeland data in the, um, for fuel cast and the rangeland analysis platform are kind of seem to be more representative to the field offices than what's in land fire for for the for mm -hmm. the BLM lands. And I'm just wondering if though any of those are being under consideration in that kind of batch you were talking about earlier. Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. And uh, I think we would like to be able to offer some alternative, you know, edited landscapes, perhaps if someone has a better landscape that they're using um, that has sort of been vetted, you know, we don't want to just throw a whole bunch of data in there that we're not certain is, you know, that everyone's good to use. But um, yeah, we, we definitely want to come up with a way for folks to be able to, to um, use some, some, so that way not everybody has to go in and make the same edits all the time. You know, like we've established this for our unit, we want to use this landscape. Um, so we've been talking about some collaboration tools um, where once you can, edit a landscape, for example, you could say, okay, you know, rest of my unit, here you guys go. This is the landscape we're going to be using for our modeling. You know, we've, we've tested it, we've validated it, and, and we're giving this the thumbs up. So whether that's you develop it in IFTDIS or you develop it outside and then bring it into the program and are able to share it, um, that is, that's something we're talking about. We've had a lot of questions about collaboration and it's rising pretty high on our list right now. So we're talking some design features to be able to do that. So, so both of those things, using outside data and, and then being able to collaborate on it. All right, thanks. Thanks. Okay, so um, we did hit the, the hour and a half mark despite the extra half hour, and I'm excited about that because we had some good questions and discussion today. Um, you know, we, we have maybe time for maybe one more question here because it's very specific to the IFTDIS application. Kim, are there any plans to integrate um, some of our fire effects monitoring? efforts that are out there you know, so that we can better reflect yeah. and, and at least document maybe some of the decisions or the reasons why we're changing land fire. Yeah, we we uh, we talked a little bit. We've talked a little bit. There's the feature in FTEM right now where you can attach a picture or, you know, some type of external document in FTEM. That's very separate, of course, from what we're talking about here. But we have people have asked, well, what if we were able to do that just in IFTDIS and attach a picture or some sort of thing that people could then reference on the map? 
And uh, so that is, that's actually on our list also. Um, so um, the, the, the more we hear from folks about the things that you guys want, the, the easier it is for us to justify spending the time and money to do it, you know? So um, these are great comments and uh, I've got notes going on here as well. And I know some of my other colleagues are listening. So, um, so yes, we actually have talked about that just a little bit. And I really encourage folks, we just come through our forum actually to pull out a bunch of user feedback to say, what are, what are users really wanting? And because as we get into the next set of development, that's where we wanna start with the things you guys want. So um, when you have ideas like this, please let us know about them. You can do it through the help ticket system. In IFTDIS itself, we all see those tickets. Um, you can post them in the forum. You can just contact us directly if you want. But um, yeah, so the FEMO thing has been mentioned and, and we agree it's, it could be a really a great value. Great. So Any we'll, other questions out there? Yeah, and we'll provide this PowerPoint. And um, like I said, please keep interacting. We want to keep talking to you guys and, and helping everybody learn more about this and, and ways to utilize these tools. So um, let's keep chatting. Jen, if there's things that come out from this presentation where people want to dig in more, let us know. Hopefully we could provide some more uh, presentation too. Sounds good. So I'm going to kill the recording then. And uh, thank you guys again. And I'll, as usual, stick around for those informal uh, discussions and five minutes of fun we can always have at the end. Thanks, uh, thanks everyone, for joining. And I'll yeah, be posting this shortly.